So tonight, I want to uh, continue to meditate with you for just five Sundays on uh, the doctrines of God's grace, as we call them, or sometimes they're called the doctrines of grace. And uh, a lot of texts, gonna, we're going to just kind of allude to a few this evening, but I'll, I'll read one that will help us. Uh, we read from Psalm 51, and then it's also on the sermon notes page, uh, uh, printed out there, Ephesians 4, on that front side. But let's turn to Romans 8 quickly, uh, and just look at a few verses there. Uh, Romans chapter number 8 tonight. And there's that glorious uh, conclusion, verse 1, that's concluding all that he's been saying up to that point. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So notice this contrast between flesh, meaning our sinful uh, sinfulness, our sinful nature, uh, and the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, the sinful nature, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. So far, God's wonderful words to us tonight. So, uh, we uh, have been thinking the last couple of, couple of sermons on the doctrines of grace. Uh, and uh, it should strike us as we uh, come tonight, you see the sermon uh, title there. Uh, what is the doctrine of human sin? So we've thought about the great doctrine of God's grace of uh, predestination or election that God from all of eternity has set his love uh, upon a people for himself. Uh, we've seen that wonderful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that he died in a way that was sufficient for the sins of the whole world or in fact an infinite number of worlds uh, if, God had in, uh, if God desired so uh, to save every single sinner uh, and that the one death of Christ was good enough, necessary, uh, satisfied uh, all the conditions of God's justice and righteousness to bring salvation to all. And then we will go on to see the power of the Holy Spirit. We see something like here tonight in Romans chapter 8. The Holy Spirit enlivens us, enlightens us, causes us to be born again, regenerated, all those beautiful images of the Bible. Uh, and then finally, that God, by his grace, preserves us and enables us to persevere uh, unto the end uh, in his grace and by faith. But as we think about the doctrines of grace... Uh, right in the middle of all of it, in, in the midst of all the wonderful grace and the celebration of God's mercy to sinners like us, uh, then we have to sort of do the Debbie Downer thing uh, and, th and think about sin. We have to think about sin. Um, why? Why would we talk about the so-called doctrines of grace and talk about sin? That's right. Yeah, you can't have grace unless there's something for God to be gracious, or some people to be gracious to, right? We can't, we can't know what grace is unless we know what our sins are. So right in the middle of, of these, uh, these, uh, these doctrines of grace, as we sort of organize them and put them into, uh, into a little order, we have to pick up sin. So what does it mean that God saves from all of eternity sinners? What does it mean that Jesus Christ died for sinners? What does it mean that the Holy Spirit regenerates sinners? What does it mean that sinners are preserved by grace? We, we, we have to define the word sinner, right? We, ha we have to explain what that means. Uh, we can't just gloss over it. We can't just uh, assume that we know what it means. Uh, we have to grasp what it means to be sinners. So it's sort of a big assumption of all the doctrines of grace that God save sinners. So we, have, we need to know. Uh, we, we need to know. We, we, we don't know what light is unless we know what darkness is. Uh, we need one to understand the other. Just think about human, human language and our own understanding. I mean, what, what would light be to us 
unless we understood what darkness was or experienced what darkness was. If we didn't feel the darkness walking into this room tonight, if we turn the lights off right now, it would be very dark. And if we didn't know what, that, what, what darkness was, and if we didn't feel the darkness and experience the darkness, how would, we, how would we know what the light was, and how would we know that we needed light? How would we know what it was to, to have our eyes open, to be able to see each other at night, in fact, in the light uh, of these uh, electric, illuminating things, right, that we have above us. Back in the day, they'd have candles and so forth. So we can't know what grace is unless we know what sin is. We can't know what uh, light is unless we know what darkness is. We can't know what it means to be alive unless we know what it also means to be dead. We can't know what it means to be uh, a person who uh, is forgiven unless we know what it is to, uh, from which we are forgiven or for which we are forgiven. We've got to know both. We've got to know uh, and understand uh, these things. So, the doctrines of God's grace lead us to think about what it is to be a sinner, human sin. So what's the doctrine of God's electing grace? We've seen that. The doctrine of Christ redeeming uh, love on the cross, we've seen that. Uh, again, we'll see the Holy Spirit in regeneration next time. I think it's next Sunday. Uh, and then finally, preservation or perseverance of the saints. But we also have to pause and think about sin. So you have your outline there, and there's a lot there. I'm just going to uh, mention it briefly, um, but this is more for you to kind of take some notes and meditate and reflect upon some of these various passages. But uh, when we read the Bible, at the very beginning, we, we begin to see our glorious creation. Our glorious creation. Uh, God, in the beginning, in Genesis 1, of course, speaks about making us in his image and in his likeness. Uh, there are all those beautiful and powerful descriptions of God making everything. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be land, let the, let the seas be gathered, and so forth. And they were. But then when God, in that, on that sixth day in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, uh, when he desired to create humanity, human beings, Adam and Eve in particular, uh, God stops and pauses and he doesn't just say it, but he has a conversation. He being they, the Holy Trinity, having a conversation. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then in Genesis 2, that same description of creation is, is God makes this, uh, this creation and there's this garden, but there's no one to water it, no one to tend it, no one to care after it, no one to guard it, and so forth. And so he, he takes dust and he molds it into this thing, this this sort of figurine, um, but it's lifeless. It's lifeless. If you've ever been in a big city, um, in Paris they have, the, have uh, Madame Tussauds, or if you've ever been in uh, Washington, D.C., there's one just on the way down to the, to, to the mall uh, in, in D.C. Uh, all these figures of all these famous people in, in the history of the world, but they're all just lifeless, right? I mean, they, they look real. Um, some maybe not as much as others, but they, they look real. They look like people. They're as tall as people. They have clothes like people. They have facial features like people, but they're not people. Unless there's life given to them. And so God breathed into uh, that, that body uh, a living, a cause it to be a living creature, a, a living soul, nefesh chaya, this uh, life, uh, creature of life. Uh, and so to be made in God's image is to have life. It's to be like God. It's to have life like God. It's to share in life like him. And Psalm number 8 describes uh, that creation from a different point of view, describing uh, the creation of huma uh, humanity. When the psalmist says, when I look, uh, when, when, I, when I consider how God has made man, he says, so what is man that you are mindful of him? Uh, the son of man that you care for him. When he looks up to the stars and he sees the sun and the moon and the stars at night and he considers how God has put them all in their place as, the, the, as creation is described in Genesis. What, what are we? What are we human beings? Uh, so, so small, so insignificant compared to these heavenly bodies. Yet, Psalm 8 says, in contrast to the stars and the moon and the sun and all the heavenly bodies, we are so insignificant, yet you, the Lord, have made him, man, or humanity, 
a little lower than the heavenly beings. Our glorious creation, it's described as image and likeness of God, the breath of life being given to us. And if we realize, if we don't, maybe we don't realize, but the human race is made just a little bit lower in glory than these heavenly beings that we call angels. And in fact, David says in that very psalm that God has crowned us like kings and queens, crowned us with glory and honor. So much so that we have dominion over the works of the hands of God. All the things that God has made, he's given that over to us. He's put all things under our feet. Sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds, fish, whatever passes along the path of the seas. Everything is below us. Because we on this earth are the kings and queens of it. Just a bit below the heavenly beings. That's how wonderful and glorious we were made to be. And so our minds and our wills and our affections, all that we are as hum human beings, all that it means to have a soul, you see there on that first page of the Sermon Notes page, there's some articles there from the Canons of Dort. I won't read those, but uh, what they say is that in the image of God, we were made with a mind, with will, and with affections. And our minds truly knew God. We had a saving knowledge of God in the beginning. We, we knew spiritual things rightly. Our wills, our choices... Uh, were righteous and noble and godly and upright in the beginning. And our affections, those deepest desires that we have, were all pure. God called, uh, commands us to love God, which reminds us that from the beginning we were made as human beings to love God and we were enabled to do so because we were image bearers. We were living creatures with the very life breath of God himself. And we were crowned to be sort of human representations of what God is as a king and a, uh, as one with authority and power and majesty and so forth on the earth. Our minds, our wills, and our affections, upright, good, pure, holy. And so we can say that what does it mean that we were made in glory in the beginning was that we as creatures were made to be as much as creatures can be like our creator, just a bit lower than the angels, the heavenly beings. So that's the height to which God has put us. He's made us on this pedestal of glory in the beginning, but yet, but yet we know the story. All those things are reversed, our heinous deformation. God created us in glory, but we, by our own sins, by our own choice in Adam, we have become heinously deformed. Notice that those things are all reversed. If you read that article from the Canons of Dort, it would, it would describe that very thing, that our minds at once had a true knowledge of God and rightly knew God, and we knew spiritual things as God intended us to, yet our minds have become blinded and, and dark. Spiritually speaking, it's like we, uh, it, it's like when you wake up in the morning and, and uh, it's dark still in your room, and you wake up and it's still hard to see. Your eyes are not yet in focus, uh, you're a little bit groggy, perhaps. You're a little bit fuzzy, a little bit blurry. You know that there's furniture in your bedroom. You know where the couch is. You know where the table's at. You know how to grope in the darkness around the corners of walls and so forth to get to the, the sink or the shower, the restroom, whatever it might be. You have a general knowledge of all the stuff that's there, but it's hazy, it's fuzzy, it's sort of blinded, it's darkened, it's futile, it's distorted. We can feel and we can sense, but yet we don't do so rightly. Our minds have become dark, no longer in the light. Our wills, as opposed to being made as they were upright, and our wills, our choices, were made to choose the, the good, the right, the noble, the holy, have become perverse. Our wills are now in defiance. Our wills are still hard towards God, or are made hard towards God. Human beings still have soul. Every human being still has a soul, has a soul, and every human being still has a will. Every human being has the ability 
to choose to worship. It's just that now, after the fall, our, our, our wills choose to worship idols. Things of our own making, ideas of our own making. Ultimately, all idolatry is worshiping self in some way. And our affections that were once pure have become impure. Those deep-rooted desires that God implanted in us to, to love God and to love the things of God and to love neighbor as self have become selfish desires, self-love, self-satisfaction, self-gratification, self-pleasure. I watched a video this week of, of somebody who was uh, talking about the freedom to be whatever they wanted themselves to be. And this person identified themselves uh, as a non-binary human being. Uh, and they, this person was free, unfettered, was able to choose uh, his, her uh, uh, reality to create one's own reality. And then as that person talked, it was really very clear what, what that person was all about. It was loving themselves, satisfying self, gratifying self, living for self, desiring self, and so forth. That's what it means to have impure affections. And therefore, because we were made on a high pedestal just a bit, below the angels in glory. We've come tumbling down, crashing down. Reminds me of that, uh, the old TV show that uh, we used to see on Saturday mornings, uh, from the, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. And there's, uh, there's an old sports show every, every Saturday morning, and there's a guy on a, on a, on a high mountain somewhere uh, up in the Alps, I think it was, or, and he was uh, skiing, and uh, he was... Uh, he was skiing down the mountain, you know, from the, from the thrill of victory. And then, you know, as the, guy, as the narrator says, the agony of defeat, the guy just takes a header down like a 10,000-foot mountain, right? From the heights of glory to the depths of depravity. We're, we're, we're conceived in sin, we, we read from Psalm 51. Uh, Paul describes us as being children of wrath, and therefore we are, uh, we're, we're unfit for saving good. We sang from Psalm uh, number 14, there's no one good, no, not one. There's no one who seeks after God. We're inclined towards evil. We're dead in our sins. We're slaves of sin and so forth. All those descriptions that, I get, that, that are listed there, those Bible verses. That's how, that's how bad off we are as human beings, apart from the grace of God. Our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones, we who... Now trust in Jesus is what we were once as well. Dead in sins. Dead in sins. How many bodies have you ever heard about that were in a, in a grave somewhere, in a casket buried under the earth, covered up, flowers begin to bloom, and the grass grows and so forth? How, how many of those bodies have come up? How many, how many uh, of those ancient catacombs throughout the Western Europe, in Rome or in Paris and elsewhere? How many of those catacombs that have the bones still there that you can go see? How many of those bones have, have got up, walked out? Dead in sins. When Paul says dead in sins, he means it. You who once, he's speaking to Christians, who once were dead in sins, but we were dead in sins. As lifeless, as dry, as, as dead as dead can be. Dead in sins. Now, of course, humanly speaking, we were alive. And people are alive. They're walking around. But we're walking as dead men, dead women. Spiritually speaking. Slaves of sin. The one who commits a sin is a slave of sin, Jesus said. And you can't free yourself from that slavery. Inclined towards evil. Inclined towards those things that God forbids us and uh, unable, uh, 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 inclined towards doing the opposite, wanting to sin. 
wanting to live life for ourselves and our own desires, our own loves, our own satisfaction, and so forth. And so Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, as he's describing there the, the unspiritual human being, the person in the flesh, the person who, whose life is characterized by their own sinful nature, their own sinful desires. He describes them in very strong ways, doesn't he? When he says there in verse number seven, the mind that is set on the flesh, the person whose life is animated by thinking of and uh, desiring and wanting and trying to figure ways out to serve themselves and satisfy themselves, that person, notice, is hostile to God. Hostile to God, right? Hostile means fighting against God. Why, he says, for it, that fleshly, sinful mind, it does not submit to God's law. Love God, love neighbor, and all the Ten Commandments and all that it entails. So the mind and the flesh is hostile to God because it doesn't submit to God. Instead, it submits to its own law, itself. But he says even more than that. Not just is this, uh, are we as human beings in this state of heinous deformation, hostile to God, unsubmissive to God and his law. Indeed, it cannot submit to God's law. The sinful, fleshly mind cannot submit to God. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's pretty bad, isn't it? That's as bad as it possibly can be. It's not just that, a person, that, that people don't submit to God. They can't. They can't. And that's why in that those canons of Dort, there's this wonderful line that encapsulates several Bible passages when it says, without the grace of the regenerating Holy Spirit, sinners neither are willing nor able to return to God, nor reform themselves. Without the power of the Holy Spirit coming to a, to a, to a, a sinfully driven person who's hostile to God, who doesn't submit to God, who can't submit to God, who can't please God, unless God does something about it, you're dead. And that's why he says just above that, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. God has done for us as a heinously deformed race, what we cannot do for ourselves, what we would not do for ourselves in a million years if left to ourselves. For God has done the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son. And so we must be miraculously regenerated. Without the grace of the Holy Spirit, we cannot reform ourselves, we cannot change ourselves, we cannot return back to the God who's made us. We must be miraculously regenerated by the power of God himself, the Holy Spirit. As Jesus describes that in John chapter 3, as he spoke to Nicodemus at night. Unless you are born again, you are born from above, you cannot see, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Have you been miraculously regenerated? Does God breathe into you once again as a lifeless corpse like Adam was in the beginning, but you now physically alive but spiritually dead? Has God breathed into you the Holy Spirit to give you this new life so that you are able to please him and you are able to come to him, to submit to him, and that you are no longer hostile to him, but on friendly terms with him. Has God given you that new birth, that new life? If you hear what, what these very harsh words say tonight, and they strike you, cry out to God for mercy. Ask him, Lord, give me new life. 
give me new life. And the, the wonder of it is, when you cry out, Lord, give me new life, breathe into me your Holy Spirit, enable me to please you, enable me to submit to you, enable me to want to submit to you, the amazing truth is that God's already at work in your heart. That's just a recognition of what God has already done. But cry out to him for mercy. Come to him for his grace. Ask him for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable you to want to return to him and to serve him. And so, that's why we, we can't talk about the doctrines of grace unless we know what God's grace does to change us, right? Because of who we are. We can't know what God's grace is unless we know what our own guilt is, our own sin, our own depravity. We cannot know these things unless we know ourselves. We cannot know God rightly unless we know ourselves. Let's ask God to teach us to know our sins constantly, to know the weakness of our nature, uh, to know our constant dependency upon him, to ask him for the power of the Holy Spirit to renew us daily so that we might then be agents to bring that good news of God's saving, regenerating grace to other sinners as well. Let's pray.